Praise the Lord, everyone. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. present 
in the house of the Lord today. Amen. 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 We certainly have some very strong associate ministers. Amen. And I asked Reverend Henry Westmoreland if he would bring the message to me. Amen. And I'm thankful to God for him not only have he been here for a number of years, but he's certainly qualified to carry the word. And we want to thank these brethren for the devotional service that the Lord has blessed us. And let's just give the men a hand of applause. All right, I'm going to ask if you would stand and receive Reverend Henry Westmoreland. to stand before you this morning in the mighty name of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that he has given us such a wonderful day that we can come together and praise the Lord uh, yeah. I won't as usual be long, real long before you but uh, just maybe a little bit longer than I normally am uh, I'd like to thank Pastor Barry just for the opportunity that he has given each and every one of us you know uh, we're, we're all born with parents, and I had a father, my father passed, praise the Lord, and Pastor Barry was there, and uh, then God, my father also, and Pastor Barry allowed me to be his son in the ministry, and it's not every day you get a chance to have three dads, and I preach the Lord, I pray, appreciate that, I really appreciate that. So uh, I'd like to thank my children for supporting me today. Uh, my grandchild, uh, my wife is, is, is ill, so she do send her blessings. Uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. It's in Jesus' mighty name, O oh Father, that we get a chance to stand before you. And we just ask that we are able to, to, to be strong and, and to be steeped into you, that you may lead God and direct us. All things go according to your will and to your word. We thank you, and we just pray that the words of my mouth, medication of my heart, meditation of my heart may be acceptable in your sight, that there may be something that someone may be able to catch on to, and it may be able to help them in their walk. We thank you. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and this we pray. Amen. Amen. So our scripture this morning is... Uh, portion of scripture is not a my preaching scripture but it's more of the subject of what I'm going to talk about today you may be seated thank you it's John 14 27 peace I leave with you as it was read earlier my peace I give to you I do not give to you as the world gives don't let your heart be troubled all fearful. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some letters of recommendation to you or from you? This is from Paul, 2 Corinthians, third chapter. Say, you yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. It's going to be important. You show that you are Christ's letter delivered by us, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on the tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. Our subject this morning is God. Is he the love of our life? This world we live in today seems to grow more and more tumultuous. With, for, with future uncertainties, we still are racked with diseases, the coronavirus, more death, 
wars, conflicts, violence, disasters. It's everywhere. Hardships, difficulties, suffering people are now experiencing may seem like God does not care. Oh, he has taken a back seat to what is going on in our lives. But this is not true. Some of the greatest saints in Christian history have endured great suffering without doubting God's love for them. Nehemiah was tasked with going back and rebuilding a wall to people he didn't know. The city had been torn down for over 100 years, and he had to go back and rebuild the wall. He had to remove communities. But yet, he knew not what he was going into, but he was faithful, and he went. Moses. One we know, he picked up a nation that was stuck in Israel in slavery, and he moved them to the promised land that God had promised. All the doubt and everything, not knowing, but he knew that God loved them. God was not promised. God has not promised Christians an easy life. Even in the middle of our trials, we know that we know certainly that our matters lie. To, our matter, our lives matter to God. We matter to God because Jesus loves us. And it's up to us to be that buffer sometime between him and others to show them what love is and to show them who Jesus is. God wants us to be in and to live in peace through faith, and we need to trust in him. God has called Christians to be the light of the world. We should be seen and foremost and be the beacon for others that are in darkness and their lives are, are running around in mess. Matthew 5, verses 14 and 16 tells us, he said, you are the light of the world and we should let our light so shine before others that they may see good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When the light of God shines from us, we will draw people to us. And we must be able to, to stand tall and tell them what Jesus has done for us. Jesus said it this way, I give you a new commandment. He said, love one another just as I have loved you. He said, you are also to love one another this way. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Do people know you're a disciple of God? Do they see you in your walk each and every day? Do you speak something good in their lives? Are they looking at your deeds and say, you know, he's a good man. I'd like to do some of the things that they do. If what God did for us was so good, don't we want to share that with others? Getting along with everyone is not love. Trying to like everyone is not love. But having a person's best interest at heart is love. We have to rise above how people treat us. Some will hate us. Some will talk about us, put us down. They'll say terrible things about us in social media. Sometimes we've even washed our hands of people, taking them off our calls list, pass them by and barely speak. But at least we forget. Sometimes, my Bible teacher says this, our Sunday school teacher says this. He says, sometimes we may be the only Bible that that person sees. That's what 2 Corinthians in the, in the third verse says. That we, have to, we have to be that example for others to see. We must so let our light shine. Our reactions, the way we react to things, are the key to show how we reach above the foolishness of life and try to touch someone's soul and show them goodness. Christians are not perfect people, but we should be the best that God got and be that representative for him. We don't want to have a conversation with Jesus when we get to heaven about how we could have helped somebody or why we didn't help somebody or I brought that person in your life and you did nothing for him. Psalms 40 and 2 tells us that I was pulled out of the desolate pit, out of the muddy clay, and set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. The King James said, it's the muck and the mar of life. Because he bought me out of a dark place that I was stuck in, I'd just like to say right here, 
I thank you, Lord. So I pray this forward, being that light for the Lord to those who might not know him. I know even on my best days that I'm still not worthy, but thanks to his grace and his mercy and his love that he has for me, then I'm able sometimes to reach out and to go forward with someone else. So we see in Acts 4 and 32, there was an entire group of believers who came together. They were of one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. They brought what they had and they put it in a collective. And what they did, they divided it among themselves and everybody left with an equal portion. Can we reach out in the world we live in and help pull somebody up that don't have as much as we? Can we, can we say something that will speak kindness and encouragement? You know, living life in a family can be tough sometimes. And, and so we take for granted that our families are, are good families, but sometimes people need to know what a family look like. Even your own family members behind closed doors don't always tell you what's going on. And so sometimes we should always be ready to reach out and encourage those. Can we do something today that would be better for them than they were yesterday? We are blessed in America. We really are. We're here in America sometimes we fail to help our neighbors because we say, when I help, I will. When I help, I can. I, I was blessed with the opportunity to be in Dominican Republic. And when you see what we take for granted each and every day and, and how other people live in, 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 they're not all third world countries, just in countries that's not as fortunate as us. You can appreciate what you have, but we have to stop taking things for granted and realize that, you know what, there's a world full of people that we can help. And so there, 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 there are many ways that we just have to be constructive and find those ways and how we can reach out and help others. In Matthew 5 and 42, God said to those to ask, those who ask, don't refuse and to those who wish to borrow. We will say things like, you know, they did not pay me back the last 20 I gave them. So what if you owed that 20 and needed a 20? We need to be responsive in our efforts to help others, treating our neighbors as we treat ourselves. This is our response. This is what God called us to do, is to reach out and help our neighbors. So we, we have to be responsive in thinking about God. He's done so much more for us than we would deserve. So why do we skim to help our neighbors and our friends? We ought to love like God did and how we respond to others. He always responds from where they are and not from where they came from. When we are at the low points in our life's journey, we may be tempted sometimes to believe that does God really care? Though we feel that we do not matter to anyone in the world, but as children of God and believers, we deeply matter to what God thinks about us. According to John 3, 1 through 3, the Bible says, See, there was a man, a man named Nicodemus, for whatever reason, wanted to meet Jesus, but he chose the cover of the night. Jesus was willing to do whatever was necessary to meet him and to help convert him, even if it was during the middle of the night. Jesus did what was needed to help another person because he loves us, each one of us. First, Jesus took the risk of being seen with Rabbi Nicodemus, which would have been against the Jewish laws. And they did it in the cover of the night and being in secret and trying to hide their meeting. But Jesus stood up to, to meet him. 
where he was needed. God does that for each of us individually, and he meets us where we are at the time we need. Even when you call God for the first time, he was there. He's always been there. God always knows that we need him, and he meets us when we ask him. I remember a lot of my trials growing up and my storms in my life. Was I, when I did the opposite of what my parents told me to do, oh, I got in trouble. Uh, we used to say, they say, boy, you got tore up. Uh, we got tore up. That's what we got, because we did. We got tore up. You know, that old adage, that old saying, ooh, you got in trouble? That was true, because when mom and dad got on you, you was in trouble. But my parents did what God told them to do. They raised us up, and they trained us, and we learned from what they were trying to train us up. And just like in trials, as you go through storms, we will sit back and reflect, and we learn from those things. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all relay the story of a perfect storm in the lives of Jesus' disciples. They were on the Sea of Galilee. On the same day when evening was come, Jesus said unto them, the twelve, let us cross over to the other side. Mark 4 and 35. He said, It happened that a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat the boat, so that it was already filling. The men on the boat were fatigued, confused, and in darkness, and in a storm of all storms. If you've ever been on the water, if you've ever been on a deep sea fishing trip, you, you, you know that when you're closer to shore, that the waves as you go out further, they get bigger. And so if you're not used to the sensation, you're in a boat that's going up and down, it's rocking forward and sideways, and, and you have a vest on, you find a place to park yourself, and you might get seasick, but you hold on. You hold on to something to keep from being tossed around. So you worry about not knowing what's going to happen, and you want to know when it's going to stop. Our hope is in short supply at that time. So in life, we have those days that test our resolve. We have rough days and we have tough days that causes us to turn to Christ. Our worry and anxiety level goes through the roof. We wonder, how will we get through this? I remember when my brother passed, I went through two weeks of asking the Lord how I'm going to get through this. I think grief is intentional because it drives us to a very deep place in Jesus where we have to spend time with him and we have to spend time there and talk and listen with him. We call on, we call on him. Lord, how am I going to make it? But he is there to hold us up and we just need to sit down so we can hear that still voice as he speaks to us to give us comfort. He says, you matter to me. He said, I got you. And he said, I love you. Peace be still. The perfect storm had arrived. Jesus was asleep on the pillow. The disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, you do not care that we are perishing. And Jesus rebuked the wind, rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Please, peace be still. And that was a great calm. From the despair of hope, Jesus stands in love for us all. I like the amplified version of Proverbs 3, 6, and it says it this way. He said, in all your ways, acknowledge and recognize him, and he will make your path straight and smooth, removing all obstacles that block your way. God wants us to have peace, trust, faith, and love in him. We get those things by standing in the Lord during the challenges of our lives. Friends, the storms on the Sea of Galilee serves as a metaphor to remind Christians that no one is exempt from the storms of life's journey just because he or she is a Christian. In all the storms of life, Christians must remember that it's Jesus that is in the boat with us. He is present and in control and nothing surprises him. Your life matters to God. 
because he loved us first. He promised in John 14 and 27, peace, I leave with you, peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful because God loves us. He said the mountains may shift and the hills may be shaken. He said, but my faithful love won't shift from you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son because people need to know they can be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. One believe with the heart resulting in righteousness and one confess with the mouth resulting in salvation. He overlooked our faults and he gave us grace and forgiveness. God wants us to be responsive in being that light in this world so all will and all can come to know him. And God wants us to know that regardless of what we're doing, regardless of what we're going through, he will never leave us nor forsake us. God is forever. He wants us to be with him forever. He desires us to be with him. 1 Corinthians 5 and 3 tells us Paul Christ. Paul says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and raised on the third day. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. That's our verse. That's what people need to know from us. That, that's how we reach out to help other people and show them love. We help them when we can, but we tell them where the real love is. Today you will be saved. Today is the decision that will be the day that will last forever. When we lift up Jesus, it's because he loved us first. Amen. Thank you. Pastor. What a powerful message. Amen. I certainly want to thank Reverend West Marlin and certainly it provoked me to think deep about this passage of scripture. Yes, that subject that he uses, God, is he the love of your life? Yes. You know, when we think about uh, the fact that God loves us so much, not just to be an attraction to us, but because he cared about us. Amen. That he was willing to give his son to pay the debt. Thank you. I, I wear this mask so much, I'm just used to it. Amen. But it, it, it means so much that God, the question is, is he the love of your life? You know, God, God so loved us that he gave his son to die for our sins. Reverend West Marlin have preached to us today and opened our eyes up. You know, we ought to think about our love to our wife, our love to our children, our love to our husbands and family members. What do they mean to us? And, and that's the thing about our relationship with God. God is looking at out of all that he had done to redeem us, to save us, to show us that he loved us. And then we have to, we, we, we love God for what we can get out of him. That's right. Now that's not true love. That's right. That's not true love, to love a person just because you can get something. If you, if you marry a person because they're a millionaire, don't mean you love them. But love suffers long. Love endures much. Love goes beyond the call of duty. And you know, what a powerful message. I want to thank Reverend Henry Westmoreland. Seriously. He, 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 he worked hard at this message. This is not something you could just throw together. 
this has been a helpful message. The doors of the church are open. Maybe somebody here today who realized the importance of what it really means to have the love of God. What can we tell him when we come into his presence and say, he says to us, I love you so. I gave my only begotten son to take on all of your sins, all of your transgressions. And so you have that opportunity to be saved. Would you stay? What you need him to do. 